Welcome. Today we're going to take a look at the book of Acts. The book of Acts was authored by Luke, who authored Luke's gospel, and serves as a sequel. As we'll see, it shows us the continued work of Jesus through his church. Now let's dive in and take a look at the introduction to this book. The book of Acts has for its author Luke, who also wrote the gospel of Luke, and he's mentioned a few times by Paul in Paul's writings, and we know him to be the beloved physician. He was a believer. He was well-educated. Uh, his Greek is sophisticated writing, and he was also well-versed in the Old Testament. He knew the story of Israel and the important uh, scriptures that pertain to Jesus as Messiah, and he uses those in both Luke and Acts to show us how God is fulfilling salvation history. Luke likely wrote the book of Acts in the early 60s. Uh, there are some historical references uh, within, the, in, within both Luke and Acts that help us to see these books were probably written earlier rather than later. And so when we take a look at those, it makes sense that Acts was written sometime after Luke. So it's impossible to be sure, but Luke was likely written in the late 50s with the book of Acts following shortly thereafter, perhaps in the early 60s. An additional detail is that the book of Acts was possibly and probably written uh, from Rome. And uh, it has a Roman provenance. And the way that we know that, or at least the way that we can surmise that, is by the conclusion of the book of Acts. The book of Acts ends us with something of a cliffhanger. Uh, with Paul and under house arrest at Rome. And you would think that if those events uh, surrounding Paul's uh, trial and the, the subsequent, you know, uh, imprisonment and execution, you would think if those things had happened, Luke would record them. But the way Luke goes, pardon me, the way Acts concludes with a cliffhanger gives us the impression that uh, that's when Luke finished writing, that, you know, Paul's story wasn't finished. And if that's true, we know that Luke was a traveling companion of Paul, so he very well could have been writing from Rome himself. Luke's genre is best understood as theological history. Luke writes um, historically, and he has great attention for detail. However, he's not only writing history, he's not just writing events, he's also telling events through key people, particularly the apostles and others, and by the middle of the book of Acts, the attention shifts to Paul, and we follow his journey. Also, however, Luke is, Luke is showing us that God is at work in these men and in what they're doing. And he's showing us the theology behind it, that God is fulfilling his plan for salvation history. So this isn't merely history. It's theological history. We believe that it is reliable, that these things indeed happened. We also realize that Luke is unfolding for us a theological message. Luke's audience, he identifies in the first verse. He does this in both Luke and Acts. It's a, it's a man named Theophilus. And in the Gospel of Luke, he's addressed as uh, most honorable uh, Theophilus, which is a title that seems to signify that he was a man of some standing, uh, perhaps some politician or wealthy person. And some people have surmised that he was Luke's wealthy literary patron, that Theophilus had commissioned the writing of this gospel. Theophilus was also a Christian, it seems, from how Luke describes him. But it's very possible that he, he financed Luke's research and the writing of the gospel. Of course, writing these documents uh, was a costly endeavor, and then we know from Luke's introduction to the Gospel of Luke, that he engaged in some investigation, so no doubt did some traveling and some interviewing. So it's, it's not unreasonable to think that the most honorable Theophilus could have been a, a wealthy patron believer who commissioned the writing of these, of these books. The purpose of Acts is to serve as a sequel to the Gospel of Luke. Now, when we look at the book of Acts and the book of Luke, it's, it's clear that they stand as independent books, uh, that the, the gospel of Luke has a conclusion, concludes with the ascension, and the book of Acts opens up as a brand new book. However, they are very dependent on one another, and they are consciously uh, written in conjunction with one another. So I think our concept of sequel gives us pretty much the best category to think of the book of Acts.
And we're going to see that the book of Acts is not just the things the apostles did, but we are to understand that as Jesus continuing his ministry through his church and through his apostles. And as we look at the gospel of Luke and Acts, we begin to see that God is unfolding his plan of salvation through Christ and through his church. Another little detail that reinforces the early tradition that Luke actually wrote these documents is that in the earliest manuscript for the Gospel of Luke, uh, it contains the title according to Luke, and that's in P75. It's an early papyrus. And then we have other several historical references to Luke's authorship of Luke and Acts. Looking at the very first verse, Luke frames his book in a very uh, unique way. Now, we've already seen that it's dedicated to old Theophilus, and he's called most honorable Theophilus in Luke. And this is, uh, this is the audience to whom Luke is writing. And of course, we can also surmise that Luke knew that this would be read by others as well, written for a wider audience than just one person. But we also see a conscious recognition of the first book. So Luke is cluing us in. He's written the Gospel of Luke, and now he's writing Acts. And notice this. Luke characterizes his Gospel as that which Jesus began to do and to teach. Now, that's a fascinating way to describe the story of Jesus, which begins with his birth and ends with his death, resurrection, and ascension. But Luke says that's only the beginning. And I think Luke means for us to see that through the work of the church, Jesus is continuing to do and to teach. If you look at the closing of the book of Acts, you see that it's very abrupt. And I'll never forget the first time I read the book of Acts when I was a young believer. And I had heard, of course, the stories of Paul. And I had heard that he'd been executed and uh, under Nero and all of these things. But when I pick up the book of Acts and I read and I get to 28 and uh, Paul, of course, is going to Rome and then it ends uh, with verse 30 and 31. He lived there two whole years at his own expense and welcomed all who came to him, proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness, without hindrance. Now, the context lets us know that he's under house arrest here. OK. But then, of course, when you read the epistles, especially first and second Timothy or second Timothy, you see that Paul is in prison and that he's awaiting execution. So Luke doesn't conclude the story of Paul. And the book of Acts just ends abruptly with a cliffhanger, similarly to how Mark ends. And I remember reading this for the first time, and I was so disappointed. I was looking for Acts part two, and it the, we don't have that, of course. We have the epistles, which fill in more for us. We have church history, which gives us a little more context. But the abrupt ending suggests that Luke actually wrote this at about this time, or else he would have recorded more of the story of Paul. At least one would one would think that. Also helps us to think that maybe Luke, who was the traveling companion of Paul, was there at Rome when he wrote. And of course, this little citation here um, that uh, he's Paul speaking to the Jews who rejected the message at Rome, and he says. This salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles, and they will listen. So the book opens with the Great Commission, with the gospel going to the end of the earth. Jesus has told his apostles to take the gospel to the end of the earth, and it ends here with this optimistic promise that the Gentiles, the nations, are going to receive the gospel. Some major themes in the book of Acts. Number one is Jesus' resurrection and ascension. Notice that Luke ends and Acts begins with Jesus' ascension. That's important to note. It's kind of like if you watch a, a series, a TV series, and uh, you come in and they show what happened in the last episode at the first, at the first part of the next episode. Um, that's kind of what Luke is doing. He's chaining those books together. However, in Acts chapter 1, there's more information and more detail given about that moment when Jesus ascends. But the resurrection of Jesus is vitally important. Uh, if you read the book of Acts, notice how many times the resurrection comes up in the sermons of Peter and Paul and others. Notice how the, how the resurrection comes up, especially in Acts 17, when, when Paul preaches at Athens at Mars Hill, and they're listening to him, 
but then when he talks about the resurrection, they laugh. So the resurrection is important for the message of the apostles. Also, the church and her mission. Everywhere the gospel goes, churches are planted. Uh, we begin with the Jerusalem church, and then we go to the Antioch church from which Paul is sent, and then, of course, more churches are planted, and then we get the letters of Paul uh, that are written to these churches. And so you can't take your eye off of the importance of the local church, but also the church and her mission. Uh, the church's mission is the, is the mission that's given in Acts 1-8 uh, to be the witnesses of Jesus throughout the earth. We cannot ignore the role of the Holy Spirit. Um, some, uh, one group of authors have said that uh, Peter's sermon on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2 sort of sets the, sets the theme. It's a programmatic passage for the book. So Peter is explaining what's happening on the day of Pentecost with the, the tongues and the things that people are experiencing. And he explains that as the pouring out of the Spirit, which was mentioned in the book of Joel. Well, as you read the book of Acts, of course, the Holy Spirit is empowering and fueling everything that happens, just as Jesus said he would when he says that the Holy Spirit would come upon them and they would be witnesses. So you want to see the work of the Holy Spirit, but you also want to see that as, as tied with the work of Jesus. So through the Spirit, Jesus is doing his work. And then, of course, the sovereignty of God. Just notice how many times God prevents things from happening or things happen which end up furthering the mission. You think about the persecution, the stoning of Stephen, but how that jettisoned the church out to go and preach the gospel. You see the sovereignty of God in that. Uh, you see Paul at times restricted from going where he would go because God is sending him somewhere else. And even in Paul's imprisonment, arrest, and voyage to Rome, uh, God is sovereign in taking Paul where he needs to go to preach the gospel. Some literary features, we've uh, mentioned a few of these already, but one to think about is Luke's accuracy. Luke includes all sorts of geographical, cultural, and historical details, and some people have uh, taken issue with some of Luke's details and said that he's not reliable, but if you assess the information, you find that uh, Luke uses specific words in specific ways, uh, specific terminologies. He gets the titles of officials correct. Uh, his geographical references are spot on. So Luke is accurate, he's reliable, and he's careful with his details. Again, we've already mentioned this, but notice that the Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts both begin with the ascension, and that's an important detail. Luke becomes a traveling companion of Paul in Acts chapter 16. How do we know that happens? Because we switch from they or them passages to we passages, and Luke begins to talk about us and we. So we know at this point that Luke has joined the party and he's traveling. Luke's use of the Greek language is refined and sophisticated. So among Greek students, uh, the book of Hebrews and the book of uh, books Luke and Acts are sort of the dreaded books uh, because they're, they contain more difficult Greek than some of the other books of the Bible. So Paul's, um, pardon me, Luke's Greek in the book of Acts and in the Gospel of Luke is refined and very sophisticated. And of course, just a cursory reading of Luke and Acts shows that Luke uses the Old Testament with uh, skill and ease, and he's, of course, very familiar with the Old Testament. Some, some theological and hermeneutical considerations. As you read the book of Acts, the role of the Spirit, okay, and, and basically the, uh, the way having a theology of the Holy Spirit is so important. And this is probably the central uh, theological concern and interpretive uh, spot of interpretive contention in the book of Acts. So you have, you have different camps that understand perhaps what's happening in the book of Acts as normative for the church. Uh, that we should expect the things that we see in Acts. Then you have others that say, no, many of them are merely descriptive. These are things that we shouldn't expect necessarily in our day, uh, but we do see them there. And I'm not going to argue for a particular perspective here. I have my perspective. 
Um, but nevertheless, it's important to notice this, that many times in Scripture, there are things that are given to us that are meant to be normative, right? But then there are things that are given that are not normative. For example, preaching the gospel and making disciples. We know that's normative. But when we see the Jerusalem church basically liquidating their assets and having all things in common, well, we, we understand that's probably not normative. We, we shouldn't expect that. Um, even in the story of Ananias and Sapphira, it's not normative. It's something they had the option to do. So when we look at some of the more difficult to understand passages, we have to ask, is this something that's normative? That is, we should expect it or we should do it. Or is this something that's merely descriptive? This is something that happened and it's being reported to us. Also rep uh, understand that Acts represents a shift from the Old Covenant to the New. So there, there are several things that are going on in Acts that there's carryover with the Old Covenant. So you have uh, the apostles still visiting the temple, things of that nature. And then you have questions about how the Gentiles become Christians and what they need to do. And I think, frankly, what we see going on in some of the things that the Holy Spirit is doing are things that are unique to that period because you see the Old Covenant overlapping somewhat with the New. And then we need to recognize that some events are presented as extraordinary. Uh, so I think some of the things that we see in the book of Acts are presented as extraordinary things that God did. And we shouldn't look at something that is extraordinary and expect it to be ordinary. Now, that doesn't mean we don't expect God to do great things at all, but we need to understand what is normative, what is typical, and, and what, are, what are the uh, extravagant or extraordinary acts that the Holy Spirit is doing. And then, of course, acts as the sequel to the Gospel of Luke, read it in continuity with the Gospel of Luke. If you read the Gospel of Luke, you'll notice that more than Matthew and Mark, the other two synoptic Gospels, Luke talks about the Holy Spirit a lot in his gospel. Uh, there's one passage where in Matthew, Jesus tells us to ask, seek, and knock, and our Heavenly Father will give us good things. Well, in Luke's version of that passage, he says to ask, seek, and knock, for your Father will not withhold the Holy Spirit from those who ask him. So Luke makes mention of the Holy Spirit in his gospel more than Matthew and Mark. So then it makes sense following from Luke to see that emphasis of the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts as well. Now let's notice some things about the structure of Acts. So the Great Commission, of course, is the church's marching orders. Uh, through the power of the Holy Spirit, we need to be Christ's witnesses. And we can just read that and know that's our marching orders, right? But there's also something uh, interesting liter literary-wise that's going on with the Great Commission. The Great Commission actually gives us an outline for the book of Acts. So if you look at chapters 1 through 7, you see the church in Jerusalem. If you look at chapters 8 through 12, for the most part, you see the church's uh, presence in Judea and in Samaria. And then 13, chapter 13, begins with Paul, uh, that begins with Paul's sending and his going out with Barnabas. And you see the gospel going to the Gentiles. So the, the Great Commission gives the church its marching orders, but it also gives us the outline for the book. So let's uh, explode that out just a little bit and have, have a little more of an outline here. So the book of Acts opens up with, of course, the Great Commission and then the day of Pentecost. And that sort of sets up the entire book. Those, those first two chapters frame the entire book for us. So much so that chapter 2 ends after the salvation of 3,000 people on the day of Pentecost was telling us what the life of the church looked like. And there's a, there's a passage there from uh, 242 to 247. It, it's a really good sermon just to preach by itself. Uh, basically, the life of the church uh, at its inception. And then you see the church going out from there. And then you see the church in Jerusalem. Okay. So in those first few chapters, and that culminates with the stoning of Stephen. And with the stoning of Stephen, the church scatters and they go out. And where do they go? Well, first they go to Samaria. And then we see them in other places. We see Philip going into Gaza and preaching to the Ethiopian eunuch. And so the gospel goes south. But we see the church going out to these places, and we see the Great Commission that Jesus gave being fulfilled. Then we see 
Saul on the Damascus Road, and we see the Lord appearing to him. And of course, he is he becomes a believer and he begins to preach. And then in the subsequent chapters, we see the first Gentile conversion, and that's Cornelius. And Peter goes and preaches to Cornelius, and he receives the vision from the Lord um, that he shouldn't call anything unclean that the Lord has cleaned. And then from there, in chapter 13, we see that third leg of the book where we're going out to the nations. And this, of course, is where Paul sort of takes the dominant stage. Something to think about is the church in Jerusalem, when they went from Jerusalem to Samaria and they began to scatter, why did they scatter? They scattered because Stephen was stoned. Well, who was standing by when Stephen was stoned? It's a man named Saul, right? So Saul was instrumental in that persecution. So even before Saul's conversion, God was sovereignly using him to carry out the Great Commission. Now think about that for a while. And then, of course, Paul, Saul, who became Paul, or Saul, also known as Paul. Um, sometimes people say, well, Saul became Paul after his salvation. Well, that's not exactly what happened. Paul is just a Roman name for the Jewish name Saul. So it's much less dramatic than that. It's just simply that Paul, Saul, took on his Roman name Paul, I think, for a Gentile context. And so you see his um, mission work split up into really three main journeys, okay? So after his first journey, you have the Jerusalem Council. Now, what happened there? Well, that was when there was some dispute that came up about how the new Gentile Christians should relate to practices of Judaism. And, of course, that was a very important discussion that was had, and uh, you can read about that in Acts 15. It's a very central portion to the theology and the mission of Acts. And then, of course, we conclude with Paul's journey to Jerusalem, where he's arrested, and he's ultimately sent to Rome. And, of course, he's a prisoner, but the Lord is using that so that he can preach the gospel. As you can see, the book of Acts is a dynamic theological history in which Luke shows us the work of the early church through the apostles, but he interprets that and he shows us that that's the continued work of Jesus through the Holy Spirit moving his church. So we see the church expanding, but we see Jesus as sovereign in all of this. And as Acts 28 goes off with something of a cliffhanger, uh, that leaves us wondering, okay, now where is our place in this story? Because the Holy Spirit is still working. The mission of Christ is still necessary, and we are his disciples.